What a song. What a praise to our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we're so glad that you've been with us throughout this Easter series. We started four weeks ago when we started our four-part Easter series. And on that very first Sunday, we were in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 28. And here's the title of that message. Jesus labored in his own kingdom, and now he has us laboring in his kingdom. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 28. And then the very next message in the series was Palm Sunday. Jesus died for his kingdom. Jesus died for his kingdom. We were in Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19, and chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, and chapter 27, verses 33 to 56. And then the third message in the series was in Matthew chapter 28 and some other supporting passages. And then we had that slide up, and then I actually had to stand up and say, He is risen. And the congregation responded, He is risen indeed. Amen. Let's do that one more time. He is risen. Absolutely, he is risen indeed. And so, our four messages for this Easter sermon series in 2022 is Jesus labored in his kingdom, Jesus died for his kingdom, Jesus reigns over his kingdom, and Jesus is coming back to live and lead in his kingdom. That's the title of today's message. Jesus is coming back to live and lead in his kingdom. We'll be in Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 11, and Revelation chapter 21, the entire chapter, and chapter 22, the first five verses, verses 1 through 5. Today we're going to take a long but quick biblical journey from the end of Jesus' earthly life to the time when all believers, all Christians, will be with Jesus in heaven forever and ever. This next section of Scripture picks up right where Jesus has been resurrected and has been with his disciples for about 40 days. Now, if you calculate that out, that's about one and a half months. And over four, over 500 people have seen Jesus alive from the dead by this point before his ascension. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, beginning in verse 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven and after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. Let's stop there for just a minute. What had the Father promised to send us? That the Holy Spirit would come. We see this in verse 5. Verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And this has indeed happened, hasn't it? The gospel left Jerusalem, then went into Judea, then went into Samaria, and now it's even into the remotest parts of the earth. Even today, you and I have heard the gospel in the United States, in the state of Texas, thousands of miles from Jerusalem. Now, here comes Jesus' ascension. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. 
And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So, we see in Acts 1 that Jesus ascended into heaven, and here we are taught that Jesus is going to one day descend from heaven back to earth. Now, here is the progression of events. From approximately A.D. 33 to approximately A.D. 90 or forward in the book of Revelation, here within just a few books of the Bible in less than a hundred years, we can learn what will happen thousands of years into the future. So far, that has been over 2,000 years. Here is the progression of the events. Now, remember, we're going to go from Acts to Revelation. We're just going to bullet point some of the major events that has happened and what's going to happen. Jesus ascended back into heaven. Jesus sat down on his throne at the right hand of his Father. On earth, the Holy Spirit comes. The church age begins. The apostles share the gospel, leading many people to salvation in Christ. The apostles start planting churches. The apostles are inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the gospels. The apostles are inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the next New Testament books. The apostles begin teaching the Jewish and Gentile believers how they are to live together as one body in Christ, the local church. The apostles begin teaching people how to live for the kingdom of God while living on earth under earthly authorities. The apostles teach believers how to suffer and die with joy and hope. The apostles preach the truth about Jesus as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords coming back one day at a second coming. The apostles preach about the end times and the tribulation suffering. The apostles teach about how several churches are not loving and serving Jesus as Jesus would have them to. Remember those seven churches that are in the beginning of the book of Revelation? Jesus points out what they're doing well, but he also points out what they're not doing well that they need to turn from and go back to doing the way they used to do them. And that applies to churches today. Are we serving Christ the way the Bible commands? The apostles teach how there will be a new heaven and a new earth and how Jesus, our rightful, righteous king, will rule from Jerusalem for a thousand years and then time on earth will end and we will live eternally with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the angelic host in heaven forever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's jump now from Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 11 to Revelation chapter 21 and Revelation 22. Revelation 21 starting in verse 1 and following. This is John writing what he saw in the vision. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Isn't that interesting? And I heard a loud voice from where? From the throne. Who sits on a throne? A king. Jesus is the king. And he said, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, 
And he, Jesus, will dwell among them and they will be his people. And God himself will be among them. The King of Kings, Jesus, is God himself. He will live among his people in Jerusalem. Verse 4, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for that type of life. Aren't you? Aren't you glad that there's going to be a time where God's going to wipe away every tear you cry? And we all cry about different things, but aren't you glad there's coming a day where whatever tears you cry, God is going to wipe them away. And there will be no longer any death. No death, only life. And there'll be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. These are the first things. They will have passed away. Glory to God. Amen. Verse 5, and he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Now, let's go back again in verse 5. He who sits on the throne. Who sits on the throne? The King of kings, Jesus Christ. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I, Jesus, am making all things new. And he said, Write, meaning write these things down. Far means because. Write. For or because these words are faithful and true. Verse 6, then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, and unbelieving, and abominable, and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Listen, this is what churches and pastors have to preach from the pulpits today and all Bible study teachers from their lecterns and classrooms. But for the cowardly and unbelieving, if a person is unbelieving in the Lord Jesus Christ, look at what's going to be their consequence. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Who's going to tell Jesus he's a liar here? I know we don't like hearing these types of passages. I know that makes us uncomfortable. Why do you think Jesus came down here from heaven and died on the cross? So that sinners would have a way to escape this second death. Did you know that every single human being from Adam and Eve forward deserves this second death? And we would have every one of us the millions and billions of people since Adam and Eve every single person would have experienced this second death, this living their eternal life in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, had not Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, stepped out of heaven, come down here to earth 2,000 years ago, and crawled upon a cross and died to be our substitutionary atonement, to take our place. That's why it's so critical. So the person that comes to believe in Jesus has faith in Jesus. That person is saved from the second death. How can we as Christians today see the world getting darker and darker and darker? We don't want to tell anybody about Jesus. When's the last time you shared the gospel with somebody? It's absolutely, eternally critical that we share this life-saving truth. Verse 9, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates. Now watch this. 
and at the gates twelve angels, and names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysoprase. The eleventh, jacent. The twelfth, amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. Can you imagine that? Can you picture these big, huge, thick, wide, tall gates that lead into the city? A solid piece of pearl. A beautiful, untarnished pearl. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. Pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Wow, how beautiful. Verse 22 I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it and its lamp is the lamb. Now listen, folks. Think about how big our sun is compared to our earth's. I used to think that if you could put one of our earth's or two of our earth's, maybe five of our earth's, and our earth is huge, if you've ever seen a picture of it. One or two or three or four or five, maybe six of our earth's inside the sun. If you could take the sun and open up a lid on the top and place earth's inside of it as if we were marbles, that maybe you could place one or two or three or five or six of our earth inside the sun. Did you know you can place 1,500 earth size balls inside our sun? It takes that magnificence of a sun to bring the light that we experience every day. We won't need that. We won't need that. Listen why. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. How bright is the lamp of the Lamb? How bright is the glory of Jesus, the King of Kings? He's so much brighter than our sun, which is so huge and magnanimous that it can hold 15 hundreds of our earths inside of it. And if you'd look directly at it with the naked eye, the human naked eye, you would go blind. You would do damage to your retina. That's the S-U-N. We're talking about the S-O-N. Not even in comparison. His glory will light up the entire earth all the way around it day and night for a thousand years. Verse 24, the nations will walk by its light. The nations, not just one nation, not just the nation of Israel. All nations will have the glory of Christ, the King of Kings' light, to live by every day and night. And there will be no night. 
The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have no lying and falsehood inside the Jerusalem, inside the gates where the king is seated? Wouldn't you love to live in a nation where there's no more lying? Only truth be told. Praise God, what a day. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Is that not incredible? Now think about these thoughts as we close our message today, as we move into the time of the Lord's table. Think about these thoughts. All that we have just read today from God's Word, the Bible, is only possible because of what Jesus did. Not what any human did, not what any church denomination did, but only because of what Jesus did. Jesus came to earth as a baby. Jesus personally taught men and women and children the real truth about God. Jesus died for you and me because we could not pay for our own sins. Jesus was dead, buried, and resurrected from the dead just for you and me. Jesus ascended to his Father and he is coming back one day just for you and me. Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ receive life and everything Jesus has in heaven forever. Jesus' inheritance becomes our inheritance. Non-believers in the Lord Jesus Christ will receive God's wrath and judgment for not believing in Jesus, the Son of God. Non-believers will be sent to hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. This is why we eat at the Lord's table. This is what we're called to remember and rejoice in Him about. Amen? All right, we're going to move into this time now. And if you will, go on ahead and stand up and start making your way here. Come on up. Either side that you would like to walk up to, there's elements on either side and the juice is in the middle. While you're coming, I want to be able to explain our slide that you're being able to see. We'll talk through that a little bit. On this slide, you'll be able to see if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are more than welcome to partake of this Lord's Supper with us. But if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, or you are walking in disobedience to Jesus and His Word, the Word of God exhorts you to repent, to turn from your sin by turning back to Christ, then that's the time to participate the righteous way in the Lord's Supper. If a person is not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, they do not need to partake of the Lord's table. It would be unhealthy for them to do so. If a Christian 
is walking in Christ, then they are to actually participate in the Lord's table unless they're not living a life in Jesus Christ. So I'd like to read to you in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. The chief priest and the scribes were seeking how they might put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. Then came the first day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, so that we may eat it. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, The teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as Jesus had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some of the bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it will take us all eternity and longer to be able to thank you for such a rich and glorious sacrifice as your son. As a father, I have two sons. I cannot imagine giving them up to die, even for a really good and righteous person, much less someone that is extremely sinful and evil and does wicked things. I can't imagine it. So, Father, thank you for your great love your great mercy, your great grace, your great compassions that are new every day. Thank you for caring about me and our world so much that you would give your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall never perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. That is an incredible beginning to John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Most of us would never give our child to death so that somebody else could live. So when we think we've arrived at being a very loving and godly Christian, we haven't. Because we haven't gotten to that point yet. So Lord, I thank you. Father, I thank you for giving Jesus to die on the cross. And thank you for the gospel that he was dead and buried for three days and rose again. And he spent 40 days with his disciples, and over 500 people saw him alive. It is a proof in history. It will always be proof. And when we see Jesus face to face one day at his second coming, and he rules for that thousand-year millennial reign as our rightful righteous king from Jerusalem, we will see his incarnate body. It's a glorified body now. But we will see those nails in his hands. We'll see those nails in his feet. We can see and put our finger to his side, just like Doubting Thomas did. 
because we will see him and realize what he did for us for all eternity to come. Lord, I pray for us as Christians in this day, in 2022. Lord, we need you to build a fire in our souls. We need to be revived. We need to get our focus back on our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the Word of God and prayer. God, only you can bring revival because once we have gotten so far away from the fire, we become extremely cold and we cannot warm ourselves up again. Father, draw us to your Son through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of prayer, through the power of the living, active Word of God. Lord, our lives need it. Our marriages need it. Our families need it. Our churches need it. But not only us, the lost community and state and nation and world need the church to be revived today. Dear God, I'm begging you for revival. Lord, we have enjoyed four weeks of being in the Word of God and watching what you did through Jesus Christ. And Lord, our hearts are on fire now. We're ready to go. Lord, help us not to just fall away again and just are meager about getting into the Word of God. Don't let us focus so much on what we have to do in this earthly life that we miss the most important life that we live, our eternal life because of our salvation. And Lord, help us to start sharing the gospel. So many Christians have gone weeks, months, years since they shared the gospel with a lost person. Lord, please turn that around and put your hand of blessing upon my life as pastor of this congregation. Put your hand of blessing upon every member and visitor that's a believer. Lead those that are unsaved to faith in Jesus Christ and bring revival to our church. May it spread throughout this local city, surrounding border cities, the state, and around our country and the world. All for your glory, not for ours. All for your glory. Lord, we remember today through the Lord's table what Jesus did for us. And we just can't hardly reconcile it. It's so awesome. It's so majestic. It's so full of splendor. It's so sacrificial. It's so giving. It's so compassionate. We can't understand it. But we're thankful just the same. We're grateful just the same. So Lord, we thank you for what you have done. And Jesus, I know that they mocked you with a purple robe. And they put a crown of thorns on your heads. And they mocked you and said, oh, hail Jesus, King of the Jews. What they didn't know was, you were really Jesus, King of the Jews. You are King of Kings. You are to wear a crown. You are wearing a crown even now. And we will see you wearing a crown one day with our own eyes. Lord, I'm even wearing a purple shirt today to signify that symbol that they mocked you with. I wear purple today in honor of the true King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ and him alone. And Lord, we want this invitation song that we're about to sing as a church family to bring holiness and honor and praise and adoration to your great name. Thank you, Jesus, our rightful King of kings and Lord of lords. In his name we pray, amen.